Romans chapter number 9. We're still dealing with the subject of the Holy Spirit, His work in the local church, in the church, sorry. He said local church, that stuck in my mind. It is the local church, but it's the church as a whole. So the work of the Spirit of God within the church, and this is the most extensive part of the study in so much that we learn a great deal about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we talked about Him filling, we talked about Him giving power, and we talked about Him comforting, directing, and leading appointing those who oversee the church and shedding abroad the love of God in our hearts. And that's where we finished up last week. I'd like you to look at Romans chapter 9 and verse number 1. And Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And then I want you to flip over to Acts chapter number 5, and uh, we'll, I'll make my, my statement then. Acts chapter number 5, and uh, so just notice there in Romans 9 that he, he spoke about his conscience was bearing witness in the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, his was a positive one. Let's look at something negative here. Verse number 1, but a certain man named... Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part, uh, be, keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all of them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young man came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So what I wanted to see is one of the works of the Holy Spirit, uh, it, possibly throughout the ages, but it's made clear in the church age, is that he holds us accountable. He holds us accountable. So in Romans chapter number 9, the Apostle Paul was saying, I'm telling you the truth, I lie not. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not saying anything more than, than what's absolutely true. I have a continual sorrow in my heart for my brethren in the flesh. But he says, I'm being held accountable by the Holy Ghost. You can ask the Holy Ghost if I'm not telling the truth. Here, these two, they didn't really care. They wouldn't mind lying to the Holy Ghost and lying to the church about uh, what, had, what they'd sold the land for. And God there kept them accountable for what they were saying. They were lying to God. And so he kept them accountable. And so I, I think that's a, a great little truth right there about how the Holy Spirit works in us today. He works by making us be accountable to him. He knows what's in our heart. He knows when we exaggerate and when we lie. And he to knows when we're telling the truth. And we should always be more concerned about the Holy Spirit knowing whether we're lying or telling the truth even than people are. I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but have you ever been caught in a lie? Have you ever been caught in an exaggeration? And uh, that's kind of an embarrassing situation, isn't it? When you find out and they're looking at you like, uh, you know, wh what'd you do that for? Why'd you lie? Why'd you say that? Why'd you, why'd you do those things? Well, it should, we should have that same sense when it comes to the Holy Spirit. He knows what's going on in our hearts. And so we remain accountable to Him. He keeps us accountable in this age. All right? Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. I am uh, I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit doesn't kill us. <laughs> Talk about thinning the ranks. I'm afraid. 
All right, Romans chapter 8, when you get that, also grab Galatians chapter number 4. They basically say the same thing. Galatians chapter number 4 and Romans chapter number 8. This is an encouraging thing that we do with the power of the Spirit of God. Uh, let's go ahead and read Galatians 4 and verse number 6. Because... Ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. All right, then we look at Romans chapter 8 and verse number 15. And it says, Therefore ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. In other words, when you got saved, you didn't come into a bondage of fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There's... Uh, there's a statement on the, the Trinity there, the Godhead, because we receive the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and because of that Spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. That's the relationship there. And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So adopted and children at the same time, verse 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So there's, we're brethren with Christ, through Christ, and the Spirit. Joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. And so the next thing I want you to see is this, that we become adopted to be children, which allows us to cry to God that He is our Abba, our Daddy, and our Father. And it, here's the Spirit of God at work, enabling us to cry out in recognition of our position. Okay? I get to speak to God saying, Abba, Daddy, Father. I get to speak to Him in that relational, familial, and familiar to, uh, terms because of the Spirit of God. He's given us that ability. And He, he bears witness with our spirit. Uh, this is what I have, I, I think, for the entire time that I've been in, in the church here, I've tried to help some that I think have had a hard time grasping the concept of the fact that we have such a close and personal relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God enables us to have that relationship. You're, you're, you're approaching God. Yes, He's holy. Yes, He's lifted up. Yes, He deserves every ounce of respect and fear that we can give Him. And yet, sons. And yet, familiar with Him and yet to call him Abba. And that's a tremendous truth that we need to hang on to. And sometimes I think we can overemphasize, if we're not careful, we can overemphasize, well, that's not the way I want to say that. We can emphasize to the point that God becomes distant to us. Can I say it that way? God becomes distant to us instead of being close and relational with us. But the Spirit of God gives us the ability to cry out, Abba, Father. We're children, and as such, we're joint heirs of, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And in the same way that Jesus was able to call out and say, Father, and he had the ear of God the Father, so the same is true of us. And it's a wonderful, wonderful truth. So he enables us to cry out to God in recognition of our position as children of God. The next thing I'd like you to see is a little bit uh, outside of, well, just go to Ephesians chapter number 6. I was trying to keep things somewhat in order, but this one is closely related to what we just talked about. Ephesians chapter number 6. And so the Spirit of God m makes it possible for you and I who are saved to call out on God as our Father in that closeness, in that intimacy. But there's something else that he does as we're praying to the Father. And as we read in Ephesians 6 and we go through the Christian's armor and the, uh, the items that were given there for our warfare, and he comes down to verse number 18, and as I've said many, many times, and a lot of people believe this as well, that this is part of our, our, our battle gear. All right? This is, this is the thing that holds everything together, really. And he says in verse number 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication and then this phrase in the spirit 
and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And so I want you to see that closely connected with crying out to God as Abba Father is the fact that he assists us in our prayers. And so we talk about in the uh, pray, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit by the aid of the Spirit of God that we're calling out in the Spirit of God's making it possible for that to happen and that He's directing us in it and that it's, it's important that we be led of the Spirit of God as we pray and that we understand what the mind of the Spirit is. And, and so He's making intercession for us in Romans chapter 8 with groanings which cannot be uttered, but at the very same time He can be directing us in what we pray for. And so it's good for us in prayer sometimes to slow down a little bit. I know it's... It's almost like on the radio, you know, when you get a little bit of, just a little bit of dead air time. It's, it's uh, a few seconds, seems like a few hours. I used to do some, a radio program, and when you got lost and you just had dead air time, it was just a horrible feeling when everything went quiet, because people expect there to be sound coming through. And sometimes that's how we behave when it comes to prayer. We're afraid to have those pauses in prayer because... You know, this is, it's dead air time. Something's got to be going on. But the truth of the matter is, is that if we pray and we pause and we wait for the leadership of the Holy Spirit, think about how effectual our prayers would be if we knew that the things that we're praying for were directed by the Spirit of God. You guys okay tonight? Or are we just contemplating? <laughs> there, is, um, there is a way of praying where we're just kind of mind dumping everything that comes to mind. And this is the reason why a lot of people say, Lord, 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 Father, 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 Lord, Lord, Father, Father, Lord, Lord, Father, 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 Lord, Lord, Father, 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 Lord, 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 in their prayers because you feel compelled to say something. But I assure you that is not how the Holy Spirit is directing us to pray. There's no need to keep calling that out. We would think we were a weirdo if we said that. Alan, how are you today? Alan, Alan, it was nice to see you today. Alan, Alan, that's a nice shirt. Alan, 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 Alan. you're a weirdo. <laughs> and so when we're talking to God, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, we're to always be praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit by the aid of the Spirit. Think about how effectual we'd be in our spiritual warfare. Think about how effectual we'd be in our supplications for one another, in our intercessions for one another. Think about how that could possibly even just change the amount of talking that we do in prayer. Some of the prayers that you read in the Bible are incredibly short and so powerful. Think about things like Nehemiah when, he's, when uh, the, the king asks him, you know, what is it that you want? So I pray to the God of heaven. And whatever he said in those few seconds were effectual enough for the God of heaven to answer him and move the heart of the king to let him go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Just, just a few words spoken in a moment of time directed by the Spirit of God. And so you see that over and over again when, when Elijah prayed. Just, just a very short prayer. When in Acts chapter number 4, when they were being threatened, what happened? They prayed just a few words, and God shook the place and gave them boldness. You understand what I'm saying? So one of the great helps of the Spirit of God for you and I is to direct us in our prayers. And just as much as I was referring in the, the prayer time, some of you didn't get to hear this, I'm sorry, but... That, that I was asking for God to direct my steps for that day, and he did. How about saying, God, direct my prayer, and he will. And, and just think how that could just completely change the way we go about praying. Now, I'm not saying that you don't do that. Some of you may already do that. But this is one of the great helps that we have from the Spirit of God in this age. If you would, go back to Romans chapter number 15. And another point here of the Spirit of God.
Romans chapter 15. We'll look at a couple of things here in this chapter. Uh, Romans chapter number 15. And I want to just look at verse number 13. He says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So he helps us to abound in hope. Now that word abound means to, to a synonym to it is flourishing. So look at the word, it's a, it's a compound word. The prefix is a, and a means not or restricted. And, and uh, bound obviously means to be tied up, right? And, but it's, it's the reverse of that. Abounding means to be loosed. Okay, there, there's, um, I've given you the wrong definition of A. As I'm saying that, I'm thinking, that doesn't sound right. The, the, word a, the, the letter A as a prefix means to, uh, to, to not be a certain way. So an atheist is, a, is someone who doesn't believe in God, right? Well, this binding, I'm so sorry that I did that to you. Uh, the binding is unbound. We abound, all right? And he says that we are loosed, we're freed, we're, we have this ability through the power of the Holy Ghost to abound in hope. And so by being filled with joy and, and peace and in believing, it results in this abounding in hope by the Spirit of God. And guys, again, I think we should just be living our lives that way, especially when we see all that's going on around us now, that we should be loosed in our hope that it should just be flourishing in our hope, that our confidence in the return of Christ should continue to grow, that our confidence in the power of God in our lives should continue to grow. Remember he said in 2 Corinthians, he said in chapter number 8, as ye abound in all things, see that ye abound in this grace also. And he wanted them to abound in the grace of giving, but he's talking about abounding in love and faith and hope and joy. And here he's saying, hey, he's the God of all hope, now you be filled with believing in that. Let the power of the Spirit of God help you to continue to grow in your hope of God. That's a wonderful truth. So notice how the ministry of the Spirit of God to us is often about bringing us great joy and peace and comfort and here hope. Okay, And then we just keep going down in this chapter and there's two things said uh, in, the, in the scriptures regarding ministry. And I talk about ministry in the sense of like the, pre the preaching of the gospel and so forth. The first one's found here in verse number 15 of Romans 15. All right, he says in verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. And here now watch in verse 16 how he becomes an example that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So remember when <clears throat> he was called and they gave him the right hand of fellowship and uh, James and John said, okay, you go into the Gentiles and we'll go into the circumcision. They said, you go to the uncircumcision, we'll go to the circumcision. Gave him the right hand of fellowship in that. And so uh, the Apostle Paul, the, the Apostle to the Gentiles, if you will, says here in verse 16 that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So, God gave me a calling, Paul says, to go out and preach the gospel, and that my main ministry would be to the Gentiles, which is kind of funny when you read through the book of Acts. Every time he went to town, he went to the synagogue. And he'd go preach in the synagogue, and they'd reject him. And he'd go, okay, I'm going back to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would get saved. It happened over and over and over again. But anyway, here he is. He says, all right, I'm going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And the offering up of the Gentiles to God, that is that they would trust the gospel message, that they would be brought into relationship with God. He said that that would be acceptable. He's talking about being acceptable to God. He's bringing the Gentiles, as it were, like a gift, saying, God, I present to you the souls of these who were not part of your nation. All right? They didn't, they didn't come to you by law. They didn't come to you by Moses. They didn't come to you by Abraham. These are outsiders. I present them to you. Let them be acceptable to you. How? Being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That is, the work of his ministry was sanctified by the Spirit of God. And so I say there that he becomes 
a, an example to us because we want all of the ministry that we partake in that we at one point can bring this to God as an offering to Him and that we can say, God, please let this be acceptable, not because it's me, not because of whatever you want to stamp on it, not because it's Baptist, not because of any of that. Let it be acceptable to you because of the sanctifying of the Holy Ghost of God. So whatever your ministry might be, you might, uh, maybe you're, you're involved in street ministry. One day you want to be able to take all that you did in street ministry and say, God, let this be acceptable to you because it was sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You might be a door knocker. You might just be a, a soul winner on your job or uh, you, 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 where, whatever. You understand any type of ministry. Maybe become a missionary. Maybe become a pastor. Maybe become a pastor's wife or a missionary's wife. Whatever it is in your ministry to God, one day you want that to be acceptable because the Holy Ghost sanctified it. And we want that stamp of approval, the power, the approval of the Spirit of God on everything that we do. You may have a ministry inside of a church to simply be an encouragement to people, right? To, and isn't that one of the gifts is someone has a gift of mercy and they encourage other believers and they help them along. Wonderful. One day, let that be presented acceptable to God by the power of the Holy Ghost. And it really boils down to this. Will you do what you do by walking in the Spirit or not? Because there's a lot of things that we can do artificially. We don't get the same outcome, but we can do it artificially. You know, I can, I can preach artificially. I can, I can try to pastor artificially. And whenever I do, you can tell. <laughs> but when the power of the Spirit of God's on it and the sanctifying of the Spirit of God is on it, there's a different outcome. There's a different spirit. So brethren, again, let's let the Spirit of God sanctify our ministry work. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll dive into a little bit of this and we might then finish up with that. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Now this is still under the heading of the Spirit's work with regard to ministry. The first point being that it's sanctifying the, ministry, the work of ministry. And the second point being showing that ministry from the individual is true and from God. And so he says in verse number 1 of 2 Corinthians 6, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in, an ex in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving. That word approving means showing to be true. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Now watch the list. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Now we can keep reading there, and there's certainly a lot of points that could be made, but do you see again that we want the Spirit of God to show that our ministry is true? Um, I met a, when I was on deputation, I met a guy who said he was called to be a missionary in Brazil, and he was on deputation trying to raise his support, and uh, we happened to all be standing around talking, and somebody said to him, how long have you been on deputation? Sorry, they said to me and they said to others, how long have you been on deputation? We all gave our times. It's relatively short for all of us. And when we got to him, he said, eight years. Eight years. Brethren, that's a long time. That's about four times the amount of time it should take. Even with a big family. And a hush kind of fell over all of us. 
And we felt sorry for him. That's a long time to be on deputation. That's a lot of money spent by other churches waiting for him to get there. And we finally, later, we all met together and we said, Brother, it may be that you've got a burden for your field, but you don't have a call. And the reason it's taking you so long to raise your support is because you're not called and people don't see the Spirit of God on you for that place. And if they could see the work of the Spirit in the ministry that you say you're called to, that you would be able to raise your support. Now, we weren't trying to be hurtful. We were trying to help him. And here what we see is that one of the marks of Paul's ministry being of God was that it was of the Holy Ghost. He said, what I'm doing, I'm doing it by the Holy Ghost in verse number 6. Notice in 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, just as a reinforcement to this, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And uh, as you're turning there, can I just say this again? This really is something that we should always be looking at. Do we see that what the supposed ministry of this person is? They say they're doing something in the name of God. Do you see that as being by the Holy Ghost? Do you see the Spirit of God on it? And when you can't see that, there's reason to question it. And that's not being mean, that's being discerning. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 um, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse number 5. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse number 5. He said, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. So we didn't just come preaching words, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit was intimately and intertwined with everything the Spirit of, uh, the, that Paul and his company were doing. And in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, the evidence of their ministry was verified by the Spirit of God. We, we've watched this video from Brother Kaufman. And if you begin to read his letters and you see the work that's taking place in, in Zambia because of what he's done for the sacrifices they've made, you clearly see the hand of the Spirit of God in it. When we pray down through our missionaries, I see the Spirit of God at work in different ways, in different levels, but I see the Spirit of God at work in them. And so again, we have to analyze ourselves by that. We can't just do it by the preachers and the missionaries. We've got to look at ourselves in that and say, does the Spirit of God have a hand in what I'm doing? Is it verified, verifying what I'm doing? Um, in 1 Corinthians, let's let this be our last one. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. We'll let this again be our last verse that we turn to for the night instead of getting to another section. But this ministry, is, is it showing it to be true? Is it showing it to be from God? And he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. And that is simply, guys, if you don't understand that, He's saying, when I came preaching to you, I'm not a good speaker. And that's one of the dangers that we have today. You know, when, we taught, when I taught Bible Institute, I taught how to outline, I taught how to speak, and I want to do that the best I can so that people can present the best they can to people. It's hard to hear somebody. It's hard to sit and listen to somebody who's not easy to listen to. It is, isn't it? And so we try to work on that. But at the end of the day, I give the tools, and then I'm just going to leave it alone. Because it, Paul, to hear Paul speak, you wouldn't say, oh, I could just listen to that for hours. You know, uh, people say, uh, they listen to these radio preachers, and some of them are pretty good, and they just say, oh, you know, they just go on and on, and, and I could just listen to it for hours. And there's a lot of them, I think, I couldn't listen to that for more than five minutes. But um, I better not go down that road too far. <laughs> Paul, when he spoke, wasn't that guy. They're not hanging on every word. 
He said, I came not in excellent, with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, it was said this once. It was said, if you, in standing in a pulpit, if you'll make much of Jesus, Jesus will make much of you. And that's what made Paul so good to listen to. Not how well he said it, but what he said. My determination was simply to know among you Christ and him crucified. Wonderful. Verse number three. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice again there, when, you, when, when it was, came to preaching for Paul, rather than being able to win people or woo people with how he said it, it was what he said. And the power of God's Spirit behind it that brought them to Christ, brought them to knowledge, brought them to understanding, to wisdom, to follow that's what it was, demonstration of the Spirit. I looked up the word demonstration, and I'm fascinated by this definition. Exhibiting certain proof, but it went on to say this, it is the highest degree of evidence. The highest degree of evidence. He said, I came in demonstration of the Spirit. The highest evidence that could be presented was the Spirit of God. And he said, and you know, when I spoke, that it was the Spirit of God. And I never wanted you to follow me or fall in love with me and my words and my preaching. And I never wanted it to be Paul, Paul, and Peter, Peter. I just wanted you to be turned to God. I wanted you to see it was of God. Now, you know, a lot of these have to do with preaching and teaching. And so, yeah, I obviously spent a lot of time thinking about this. But Sunday school teachers, this could be true of you. Those who stand in the pulpit and fill in Wednesdays and Sundays and, and do those things, or you speak to somebody about the Word of God, you give a Bible study, it should be in demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. That's what we're aiming for. And it's not always about the, the professionalism. Joel Osteen's professional. But there's no power. People are drawn to it for another reason, because he tells them what they want to hear. Brother Unruh, for those who were here when he preached, that was demonstration of the Spirit. And you know when you've been spoken to by God. And so I hope that we get that here too, from all of us, from all of us that stand and teach and preach, but you as well. When you speak to somebody about the Bible, let it be in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So we want the Spirit of God with regard to ministry to show it's from Him and it's not man-made. Okay, Father, thank you for the truth again of the Bible. I, I love studying about your Holy Spirit. And I've loved being able to break down point by point all that we learn about Him. And I pray that these things will all be true of us. And Lord, thank you for what we've been able to look at tonight. Please take us home and dismiss us with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.